This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. Hi, welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney, and today on the download, we have uh, kind of a mixed bag uh, with the long holiday weekend of Memorial Day uh, coming that we're coming out of. The markets uh, didn't really have a whole lot of chance to do much. Uh, typically, it's a relatively uh, flat trading weekend, and uh, the, the markets kind of reflected as such. But we do have energy stocks rallying from uh, news on the European Union that the EU will ban almost the entirety of all energy imports from uh, from Russia due to the uh, continuing uh, bloodshed that is going on in Ukraine. So uh, this has sent several U.S. energy stocks significantly higher. Uh, Exxon Mobil is trading at an eight-year high, and Chevron is trading at an all-time record high right now. So this could definitely be an interesting time to make some plays in the energy sector market. It's uh, certainly something to be a little bit watchful of when it comes to kind of uh, seeing what's going on uh, externally from the U.S. You know, these large U.S. energy companies do have considerable considerable conglomerated holdings worldwide. So when a large uh, energy consumer such as the European Union decides to shift away from a large energy producers such as Russia, the opportunity for share prices and value in these particular markets of U.S. energy companies uh, is going to be rife for improvement. So definitely something to watch out there for. Uh, But one thing that we're still kind of closely watching and monitoring in the U.S. is inflation. It's still kind of one of those things that is omnipresent in everyone's mind. We're seeing a lot of things that are really pointing to a continued uh, block of just considerably higher inflationary rates with regards to a lot of things, such as uh, car prices. Uh, now, we had seen um, some supply chain issues start to ease with uh, semiconductors and other raw materials uh, starting to become more abundant from the easing of COVID restrictions from Asian and Southeast Asian countries coming into the U.S. So automakers like Ford, Toyota, General Motors, Chrysler, all seeing a ramp up in production of uh, general in, in general of most of their lines of automobiles, which is causing the stock of new of new inventory to become uh, much greater. Now, this is all well and good for people looking to buy new cars, but the secondary used car market, which is traditionally seen um, as a good place for a lot of people to buy vehicles that are looking to save some money and maybe not take such a big hit on depreciation, is still incredibly inflated. We are seeing almost a seventy percent increase in used car prices uh, from the past two years. So starting in 2020, coming to now, we are still seeing those rates of extremely high inflated prices on the secondary used car market uh, sticking around. And the prices of new cars, with still having the scarcity of availability, uh, are getting driven up by uh, people charging over it, charging over MSRP and a lot of other things going on on the secondary market with car flippers as well. So it's still very hard for... <clears throat> Uh, typical Americans to kind of catch a break when it comes to those larger purchases, uh, as well as almost a 10% across the board rise in grocery costs, especially with things such as grain and soy-based products that have a lot of dependence on Eastern European and Russian imports. Uh, Things such as uh, whole wheat and barley uh, up almost 20% uh, on their import pricing. So definitely something to watch out for. It's not just uh, some of these larger things that we're seeing some improvement on, uh, there definitely is a lot of other pain and inflation. So looking at the bottom line dollar for some of this kind of stuff now, when looking at it in the context of you know where to make some money and as far as where to invest, uh, it's definitely going to be something interesting to see because some of these things are kind of hard for the average investor to kind of really get into. But looking at commodities markets such as uh, you know, raw goods and material production is going to be something that I think is really going to be of value to people, especially if you're just looking at uh, doing some commodities trading. It's going to be something that I believe will really be a sector where there could be some some definite money to be made. Now, the U.S. Treasury yields are trading higher on the news that the Fed is planning on continuing their uh, lending rate hikes to try to curb some of this inflation. Now, this is 
good in some contexts, context and bad in others. You know, for people that are looking to uh, purchase new homes, uh, this certainly is you know rather painful as the uh, mortgage rates for people looking to buy new homes is about five and a half percent right now. Now, this, of course, is still historically very low, but in the context of what we're looking at from where people were being able to buy homes with almost free money uh, in the past few months and in the most certainly in the past few years, uh, definitely a little bit painful with how expensive homes already are. Now, there's a report from the National Association of Realtors that shows that, and this is always a 60-day uh, rolling uh, lag period just put out that the NAR showed, National Association of Realtors showed that home prices rose 20% in March of this year. Uh, that is just absolutely wild, meaning that a $100,000 house uh, is now a $120,000 house or a $200,000 house is now a $240,000 house. Uh, it is just absolutely crazy to think of just how much of an increase that is for things that are that expensive already. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how much of a curve that these rate hikes have on inflationary measures, or maybe even things as specific as home prices uh, will definitely be uh, you know, something to watch out for um, and see what exactly it does. But at least treasury bond yields are increasing. So one place that people can look for value would be investing in treasury bills. Now, another thing to look at with regard to inflation and supply chain issues, uh, and some really good news that China has lifted almost about 70% of their COVID restrictions. So we're seeing a very large jump in share prices for Chinese uh, e-commerce giant Alibaba, as well as the Tesla Shanghai uh, Gigafactory coming almost back online to full capacity, which is fantastic news for the auto manufacturer to try to get things uh you know, moving in a more steady direction with regard to production and things coming into and out of China. As you know, that the Chinese and the Southeast Asian markets are rife when it comes to uh, the location for production of raw materials and semiconductors. So seeing that some of these uh, industries coming back onto a more full-time basis is, is nothing short of wonderful for what it's going to do for the U.S. economy. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Again, not a whole lot going on per se in the world of securities and stock markets, but those are kind of some of the big movers. Energy stocks moving, treasury yields are increasing, um, the interest rates are going to climb. We're still seeing a large amount of inflation going on, but at least now we're, at least from a monetary policy perspective, at least trying to take some action against that. So there's some good news. Hope everyone had a wonderful holiday weekend. This has been The Down. Today on the what is, what is a bear market? Now, there's been a lot of talk of bears and bulls and plane strings and automobiles. And oh my, when it comes to stock markets recently. But uh, one, two terms that get thrown around a lot are bear and bull markets. Now, we have been in a bull market pretty much uh, for, a, for a very long time, meaning that stock prices are rising, investor sentiment is high, uh, risks have typically been uh, mitigated. But uh, we hear a lot of people talking about moving into a bear market. What exactly is that? A bear market is when a market experiences prolonged price declines. It typically describes a condition which security prices fall 20% or more from recent highs and been widespread pessimism and ne negative investor sentiment. Bear markets are often associated with declines in overall stock market indexes like the S&P 500, but individual securities or commodities can also be considered to be in a bear market if they experience a, client, a decline of 20% or more over a sustained period of time, typically two months or more. Bear markets also may accompany a general economic downturn, such as a recession. Bear markets may be contrasted with upper trending bull markets. This is a bear market, and this has been The What Is. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in for another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. We're very pleased to welcome back for a second time, John Schaub. Thanks for being on with us today. Thank you, Alex. Fantastic. All right. So 
Um, before we kind of get into the meat of it, uh, give us a little bit of background about yourself. Uh, I know you've been investing in real estate for a long time. You've definitely seen quite a few different market cycles with regards to things like uh, interest rates, uh, inflation and stuff like that. Because, uh, you know, you uh, like some of the unlucky few got to invest through the 80s when uh, mortgage rates were up into uh, the double digits. So uh, give us a little bit of background on, uh, you know, kind of your investing uh, history and then we'll get into uh, the topics that we're going to discuss today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but way back, way back when I was in college, I managed a little apartment building and then I sold it. So that was my introduction to real estate and uh, had my real estate license in college. And when I got out, I, I started uh, doing a lot of different things in the business, uh, bought a lot of different types of properties, I had a motel, a restaurant, a wine and cheese shop, uh, apartment buildings, duplexes, several land deals. And, and after experiencing a lot of those things, some of them went well, some of them didn't go so well. Uh, I, I settled on buying houses and it was an interesting transition and uh, my, my house's uh, investments have made me more money than the other types of investments and they've been less work. And those are two things I go for, you know, more money, less work. So I, I try to keep my life as simple as I can, own as few investment properties as I can and make it work. So I'm, I'm not the guy who wants to go out and buy a thousand houses or a thousand of anything. I, I, I want to enjoy life. I want to enjoy it every day. So I focus on buying properties that are not management intensive, that attract long-term tenants. Uh, and, and most of my tenants stay with me, you know, more than five years. Some of them stay with me as long as 30 years. So, um, you know, it, it's a simple plan. I've, I've written a book about it called Building Wealth One House at a Time, which really explains it well. So I recommend that to people, especially people getting started. Uh, but as you say, I've, I've been in doing this for a long time. So I've seen a lot of changes in the market. And one thing that's constant is people like to live inside, you know, you uh, during our last recession, which is a humdinger, you know, we had property values drop in half in my town. So a $300,000 house went down to 150 or less, uh, but the rents didn't drop that much. They dropped some and uh, about 10% of our people just left. And those are the folks that were in the uh, construction business because our construction uh, business went from, I, I won't don't have a real number, but let's just say several thousand building permits a year to zero. Well, when that happens, when people stop building, stop fixing up houses, uh, a lot of people become unemployed and they go someplace else where they can get a job. And of course, it affects everybody who supports those people, the, the folks in the uh, building materials business and, and uh, all, all the support people in town that, that rely on that kind of income. So uh, I... Uh, I think that kind of sums it up. I'm still doing this. I like what I do. I manage my own properties. Uh, I still buy properties. And uh, we've been waiting here for the last couple of years for this next recession. And I think it's getting closer um, because that's where we, we find our best opportunities. Uh, most of the properties I've bought over the years have been from people who want to sell in a hurry. They have some reason they need to sell and they need to sell right now. You know, Not six weeks from now, not six months from now, but now. So they're willing to take a discount or give me great terms in order to get out of a property that they no longer want and that that's a burden to them. Uh, and the last one I bought was exactly that. And that's just been fairly recently. So we're, uh, you know, we're waiting for the next downturn. I've been uh, giving people advice for, you know, for a long time. I mean, as you know, I write newsletters and teach seminars. So when we teach or write, you know, I, I tell people what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and uh, hope that the benefit of my experience will help them in some way. Yeah, awesome. And I think you brought up a really good point kind of in that initial introduction is that, you know, it's not always necessarily, at least with real estate, doesn't matter so much on what the price is of the property. If you're buying for cash flow, you know, if you own a property and it goes from, you know, worth half a million to, you know, let's say 250, but it's still renting for, let's say, 5% of the rents when you initially bought it, then, you know, what's really the effectual uh, issue that you're running into. And I think that's one of the nice things about real estate is that if you're buying for cash flow, obviously flippers and things can get kind of uh, burned if there's a large appreciable drop in value. But if you're buying for cash flow, like you said, it's going to be something whereas if you bought stocks for cash flow, you know, I know a lot of people that listen to this don't necessarily 
fall into that, um, you know, kind of mold. But, you know, those those kind of earnings and dividends are based on share value. You know, if the value of the property dips, but the rental, you know, rentals typically don't correlate so much to the actual underlying value, you can still be in a pretty good position so long as that you buy right, you know, with the correct terms, financing uh, and, and the like. So I think that's kind of, you know, what I'd like to cover a little bit today, especially in the context of how, you know, a lot of people would say that the housing markets are incredibly inflated, especially down here in Florida. And I wouldn't say that they're probably too far off the mark, you know, we definitely have seen a large jump in home values and as well as compared to things like the CPI index and all these other inflationary measures, especially with, uh, you know, the Fed trying to rein that in with, uh, you know, raising interest rates to try to curtail some of this. I think it's really kind of interesting to see, you know, how people's strategies can change, but also not have to change that much so long as that they're kind of, you know, focusing on, you know, the correct things to focus on when it comes to buying real estate. So, you know, as real estate, you know, at least in today's market, still, you know, a, a viable option for people to get into even at this present moment uh, with things like inflation uh, being so high? Well, real estate is not a short-term investment. And uh, speaking of stocks, I can I can tell you that I, I do own some stocks. And during the last downturn, our dividends disappeared. So cash flow in the stock market can just disappear. These are big stocks, these are like Bank of America. You know, these are not little stocks. And uh, in a real estate business, cash flow just doesn't disappear. And, and you know, if it, unless you're not paying attention, you know, if you're a landlord and you're trying to get top dollar rent, and the market is tanking, and tenants are moving out, and there's a lot of vacancies, and you're still trying to get top dollar rent, then you're going to have a lot of vacant properties. Our, our uh, goal is to have no vacant properties. We're we're totally full right now. We stay full. And we anticipate uh, slow times coming. And, and I think perhaps next year or two, we're going to see some slow times coming where there'll be more unemployment. And then that's what directly affects your rent is your unemployment rate in your town. And so knowing that that's a potential, we have raised rents. We have raised rents uh, pretty dramatically for the last two years, uh, but we're still a little bit below the market because I don't want my people to move out because they can find a house right next door for less money. So I stay on the low side of the market and I make my profits because when I buy, first of all, I buy very high quality properties. I buy properties that I'm, I'm confident will appreciate over time and will always be in demand. So while other people's may have vacancies, uh, because we have better properties and we're able to rent them at a very fair price, we stay full. And, and that's really important during a recession because during a recession, if you have a lot of vacancies, you'll be really focused on filling those vacancies. You know, you'll take a lot of your time to manage those empty properties and to fill those vacancies, and you won't have the time or the resources to go out and buy when the prices are the best. You know, the best time to buy is right at the end of a recession when prices have been going down for a year or two, and, and they may have dropped quite a bit, and there's a lot of people trying to sell, and there's not many buyers. That's the time, the best time to buy if, if you want to buy things below the market and on the best terms. So you want to be in a position to do that. I returned from California last night. I was there all last week. And uh, I can tell you that, that just like here, uh, there's a lot of nervous people in California because although our prices have gone up a lot, they haven't gone up nearly as much as they have in California. I mean, it's not uncommon at all to find people buying three and four million dollar houses out there for investments, you know, so they are, their, their numbers are way different than ours. And as you probably know, I've been teaching in California uh, for a long time and my students who bought houses out there uh, for a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars that are now worth a million or two million dollars are pretty happy with me. <laughs> and I'm a happy guy, you know, we've been buying here in town in Sarasota for a uh, uh, more than 40 years and we continue to buy and, and we continue to buy higher and higher quality properties. And let me just define that so people don't get confused. I don't mean we're buying big fancy houses. That, that would be a, a, a poor strategy, I think. Uh, you know, a big fancy house is a very high maintenance house. And uh, if we put it, the wrong people in there, they can do a ton of damage. So our houses are not big fancy houses, but our houses are in neighborhoods where people really want to live and you can tell these neighborhoods are very uh, desirable because people are spending a lot of money on other houses in those neighborhoods. They're, they're, they're doing total remodels. Sometimes they just tear a house down and build a brand new house. 
And, uh, and, 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 you know, as you know, I, I, when I teach, I tell people the lot and the land value is, is more uh, of a, an important factor to me than the house value. So if I can buy something for less than a land value, I'm, I'm not as fussy about the house as long as it's functional and it'll attract somebody who will stay for a while. I had a friend who just bought a shopping center here in town and they bought it for less than a land value. Well, that's, that's the way you make big money is, is you look for deals where you can buy something for less than what just the land is worth and you get the improvements for free. Uh, so that's kind of our, our focus. And, and uh, you know, our, as I said earlier, our focus is to own as few properties as possible and make it work. You know, if you buy more properties than you need, you're just working more than you need to work and you have more risk. So fewer properties is good. Higher quality properties is, is a, a, I think, a very strong strategy because then you can attract the best tenants in your town. And the best tenants in your town will do some remarkable things for you. I mean, I've had tenants put in new windows. I've had tenants do all sorts of work to their houses, new flooring, new fans, all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, on, on their nickel. And uh, you won't find that in, unless it's a very desirable place. Now, when you say, you know, that kind of, you know, segues into, uh, you know, attracting those types of people. With regard to that, you know, when you're purchasing these, you said, you know, obviously you're not trying to buy, you know, the you know, the, the glit, you're not buying for the glitz and the glamour, you're buying for the utility of what people are looking for and, and a quality product in that segment. So, you know, what exactly, you know, are kind of some of the criteria to look for when you say, you know, a good quality, you know, high quality houses like that, that attract those kind of people, you know, what are some of like the things are these, are these going to be places that are near, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, you know, what are kind of a general set of metrics that you might look for as an investor coming in and saying, okay, great, you know, I'd like to buy these higher quality properties, um, obviously understanding that it's not, you know, the million dollar mansion, but you know, what is, you know, that def definition of the metric of high quality to attract those high quality tenants? Well, okay. it, it's a uh, location. You know, it goes back to the old location, location, location thing you've heard many times. And so it's good schools. It's uh, close to where people work. It's safe neighborhoods where people can go out at night, walk around and, and feel safe. It's neighborhoods where they can talk to their neighbors and everybody uh, seems to get along. Uh, you know, I'm, when I buy a house, one of the first things I do is go across the street and meet the neighbor who lives directly across the street. Uh, the most the house I bought most recently, uh, when I bought it, had a tenant in there. So I inherited this tenant. And I think one of the reasons that people sold me the house is they didn't like this tenant. And they were might have been afraid of this tenant. I'm not sure. But, you know, tenants don't intimidate me. Uh, so we, we had a little conversation with the tenant. And after a while, and it was, a, it was quite a while, we moved him out and have now fixed this house up. So now it's instead of the ugliest house on the street. Uh, with a bad tenant in it, it's probably one of the best looking houses on the street. Uh, and we haven't put a tenant in there yet, but we will probably next week or two. But we'll put a really good tenant in there. And when I say good tenant, it'll be somebody who, who uh, will respect their neighbors, who will take care of that house, who will pay their rent on time. And uh, the house will be in excellent shape, so they won't have to do anything to it to start with, but they'll have to maintain it, change the air conditioning filters and not beat the house up, you know. And I'll be looking for somebody who wants to live there for a specific purpose. Uh, it's in a really good school zone, the best school zone in this town. So hopefully it'll rent to somebody. And it's a three-bedroom, two-bath house with a family room, a porch, and a, and a fenced backyard. So I, I, my plan is to hopefully rent it to somebody who, who wants a house just like that. And maybe they want that house because they want their children to go to that school and uh, and be there for a while. So, you know, that that's kind of my, my uh, typical story. I don't like to rehab houses. And uh, this house wasn't really a rehab job. We didn't have to do the kitchens or the baths. It had a new roof. It had new air conditioners. But we painted it. We put new floor covering in it. Uh, we cleaned it up, cleaned up the yard. Uh, the neighbor put a new fence up. So we've been able to kind of tie into that new fence. And so the backyard is, is looks really nice now. But the, the tenant, uh, the lady, the lady who lives across the street is now one of my best friends. I mean, she loves me because we have, first of all, gotten rid of a bad tenant, somebody who was troubled that I didn't put in there. So it wasn't my fault to start with. And number two, we have made that house look good and it's right across the street from her house. So now she gets to look at a pretty house, not, not a house that, that needed a lot of work. Uh, so she'll keep an eye on that house for me and she knows I own it. 
And I'm not, uh, you know, I don't hide. Some, some landlords like to hide, pretend they don't own anything and, and uh, not, not talk to any of the neighbors. That I'm the opposite of that. I, I like to know my neighbors. I like them to know how to get a hold of me. Uh, I don't give them my personal cell number, but I give them a business number they can call because I want them to call if uh, we put a tenant in there and a tenant doesn't behave well for some reason, you know, sublets a room to somebody and now we've got extra, extra cars or they, they've got a, a dog that barks all the time, you know, whatever it is, we'll fix that problem. And, and that's what I tell that neighbor across the street. I said, if we make a mistake and put somebody in here who doesn't treat the house well or doesn't, doesn't fit in your neighborhood well, uh, you let me know and we'll, we'll solve the problem. And uh, by telling the neighbor across the street that, that puts a lot of pressure on me to put the right people in that house who will take care of that house and will be good neighbors to the people who live, live around them. So it's a, you know, it's a, I'm in the same town that I've been in pretty much all my life since I was six years old, all my investment life. And a lot of the business we do is referral business, either from past tenants or somebody else we bought a house from or people like the neighbor across the street who knows somebody else who wants to sell on that street. They will call me. So so being, uh, you know, a good good neighbor to other people and taking care of your properties and renting them to people and, and making them behave uh, once they're in there. Uh, is all good business and, uh, you know, allows me to sleep well at night. I'm not worried about anybody suing me. I've never been sued. I'm not worried about my tenants being mad at me. They like me. I could show you a letter right now, but you can't see it uh, from a letter who's uh, been with me for a long time here. See if I can find a, a light. Here, here's what she says. Uh, it has been a pleasure renting this lovely home and getting to know you over the last nine years. Okay. This lady's been there nine years and now she's moving to Texas to be across the street from her daughter. She really doesn't want to move, but it's a family situation. So, sure. uh, but you get that kind of letter from folks who, who are good tenants, who, who enjoyed the house, who, who, you know, have enjoyed having you as a landlord. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point to make. Now <clears throat> to kind of shift gears a little bit, it's always good to understand, you know, what the, you know, what the ideal situation for putting someone into a particular property, you know, would be for, let's say, let's say this, you know, that's, that's assuming that we've acquired the property that we're looking for. But, you know, the issue I think a lot of people are running up against right now is, you know, just the underlying asking prices for these particular houses. You know, you can obviously still find a few deals here and there, but for the most part, you know, obviously values across the board have risen dramatically over the past, you know, two years, especially, but, you know, over the past, you know, 10 years of that, I've been, you know, helping people invest in real estate. Uh, it's been, you know, pretty much a, you know, a, a, a 45 degree angle on that chart uh, of, of values. So when looking at that, you know, and, and with interest rates for, you know, commercial, uh, or I should say institutional lending getting more and more and more and more expensive, I kind of really shines a light on the importance of being able to acquire owner financing or really being able to get creative with terms. So that way, you know, you can get these good properties in these good areas. What exactly would you say is kind of the, the most important things people need to understand when it comes on the acquisition side of saying, hey, you know, there are more options out there than just going to, you know, you said Bank of America, going to B of A and applying for a home loan for this stuff, you know, because, you know, you have really fixed products, you know, what are some of the big advantages that people can see from trying to get into the aspects of getting creative with the financing part of this, especially when it comes to trying to get owner financing on some of these properties that are getting more expensive by the day? Sure, sure. Well, as I explained in detail in my book, uh, when I started, I had uh, some income, but not enough income to qualify for a bank loan. And I didn't have any credit history to speak of. I was young, you know, I was fresh out of college. Uh, and when I found a property that I wanted to buy, that I knew, but in, in my mind at that time anyway, it was a good deal. I had to go out and, and figure out how to buy it. And, and the, going to the bank was just not an option. So a lot of folks today see the bank as their only option because, you know, Rocket Mortgage and all the uh, lenders that are out there will, will hound you. And they hound me all the time. I, get, I came back and checked my calls from a trip to California. I had five calls from Rocket Mortgage trying to lend me money, you know. Uh, it, it's kind of funny. So the lenders, are, they're, and, and these people are just money brokers. It's not their money that they're lending to you. And you get that, I know. Yeah. Uh, you know, banks don't lend their money. They lend depositors money. So they have a fiduciary for, with their depositors, and they have to be careful about who they lend the money to and, and make sure they get it back or they can't pay the depositors back. On the other hand, if you, if you learn about seller financing, about buying from a seller, 
who will finance that property for you. So you don't have to go to a bank. It's a whole different way of looking at acquiring property. Uh, you know, if you think about the comparing real estate to the stock market for a second, there's no seller financing in the stock market. If you go to buy a stock, you have to save up your money and write a check and buy that stock. You can sure you can use margin, you can borrow part of your purchase price, but typically the income from the stock won't pay back your loan. The beautiful thing about real estate is you can finance a piece of real estate and the income from the real estate will pay back your loan. So my rule of thumb is not to buy something unless the income from the real estate will repay the debt. Uh, now that that changes with time, uh, but as you pointed out early, I, I bought houses and I bought uh, 16 houses in 1981. Every one of them had a 14% loan on them. <laughs> so you say, "Wow, how how do you make it? How do you make it work with a 14% loan?" Well, the answer is that that you scramble and you find other folks who will come in and invest with you and help you pay those loans, or you refinance and pay those loans down as fast as you can, uh, or you find sellers who, or buyers who will, who will uh, uh, help you by buying houses from you on lease options. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, the 14% loans were not loans I got by going to a bank. They were loans that are already on these properties, and they, the sellers were just walking away from them. They were walking away from these properties. Now, you might say, well, nobody's going to walk away from a property now because they have a good loan. And I, and I agree with that. You know, most people who have bought a house over the last four or five years and, and all my kids have bought things and I've encouraged them to do this. You know, they have loans that, that are three or 4% loans. They're terrific loans. And, and you should understand that even today with loan rates, you know, the um, owner occupied rates are about five and a half percent, give or take a little bit today, depends on what kind of loan you get. But those are cheap late rates. You, those are, that's cheap interest. If you can't figure out how to make money at five and a half or six percent, uh, you you're just don't know enough about the game yet. Uh, so you are looking for properties that people who own them want to sell them for some reason. And then the houses I bought back in, in uh, the 80s and the houses I just bought, the, the houses that are owned by folks who don't want them anymore for some reason. Maybe they're sitting empty. Uh, maybe they've got a bad tenant in there. Maybe they've left town and have bought another house. Maybe they never bought another house in your town, but you look for that seller who has a reason to, to sell other than just holding out for a big profit. And then you make him an offer that works for you. And uh, so you need to know before you make an offer to buy a house, how much it'll rent for, what your expenses will be, your taxes, insurance, and maintenance. So you have a net number to work with. And then when you make your offer, you offer the seller that net income for their house. And if they don't accept it, uh, then maybe that's not the right house for you. And, and there's a lot of other twists and turns we can take here to, to get to better cash flow for you, like bringing investors in with a, for part of the down payment or, or co-owning houses with other people who, who will pay part of your payments. Uh, but that's a little more, more complicated than we need to make it today. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the kind of the interesting things, I think, especially from the uh, seller financing side of things so you can also come in to this, you know, you talk about attracting good tenants to, you know, raise up, you know, not only the house in your portfolio, but also the people around you, but also you can kind of bring that, um, you know, that benefit to the transactional side of things of buying something with giving a benefit to the seller past just a check for their property, you know, it's, uh, you know, talking about interest and all this kind of stuff, it's hard to not glance into the realm of taxes, uh, which is obviously the world we live in. <laughs> but, you know, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Uh, and, you know, being able to offer someone, especially with owner financing, the ability to not have to take the entirety of that, you know, large cash pay with how valuable property has become, you know, if you're talking about people with, you know, multiples of profit on these properties, being able to offer them the ability to get out of their property, not have to get a whole, you know, huge deposit at once, and then being able to amortize that income over time, not only gives you the ability to kind of fine tune that deal to make your cash flow work with what your payments are going to be to them, but also giving them the extra added tax benefit of not having you just say, okay, I'm taking a huge cash payout of this, um, you know, looking for people that are, you know, again, motivated, but also helping to, you know, give some benefit on that side, because who knows, maybe they have other properties, you know, that they're willing to sell. And if you give them, you know, something of great benefit, like a tax benefit like that, that can help also open doors down the road. Um, do you see that as kind of a thing that people can 
Eglis utilize in this particular market or are, you know, people's underlying basis and write-offs kind of making that less of an attractive deal, you know, for people going in to try to acquire owner financing from a property? Well, it depends on who you're selling and buying from, Alex. If you're if you're buying from another investor, you know, if you're buying from me, a house I bought for 50 and now it's worth 700000 sure, taxes are an issue because I don't live in that house. There's no tax uh, benefit for me, uh, you know, from selling that house because it's not my personal residence. So I'm, I'm probably interested in that. And there's another reason. I, I uh, had a house I was buying from a lady and she had inherited this house. Well, when you inherit a house, you don't have to pay taxes on the gain because you get a stepped up basis. And this is about a $500,000 house. And uh, But she wanted to finance it because if I wrote her a check for, say, less than five hundred, just say 400000 and she put that 400000 in the bank at 1%, her income would be very low. So she wanted to finance it, and she would finance it for me and did for at 4% interest. Well, at 4% interest, the, money, the deal worked. You know, there was enough uh, income to cover the expenses on it. And uh, she was happy to get 4% because if she put the money in the bank, she'd only earn 1%. So there's two sides of this. Most of the houses I bought have not been from people who had tax problems. You know, if somebody uh, you're talking to is trying to sell their house and they're anxious to sell, the chances are they have income problems, not tax problems. You know, they're, they, they, they're having trouble making the payments on their house. And when somebody's having trouble making payments on the house, especially if it's an empty house, they are anxious to sell that house and they will make you a deal that's far better than, than the deals you normally see in MLS. You know, I teach classes, but I only teach them once a year and I haven't taught in two years now. But when I teach a class, we take people out in neighborhoods and we find houses that are sitting empty that are owned by people who want to sell those houses. And, and the profit is not important to them. Getting rid of the house is important to them. So if you change your mindset a little bit and don't, don't look for people who just own a house for sale, but you look for somebody who owns a house that that, that house is eating a hole in, you know, or it bothers them every day. They're not sleeping well because of that house. It, it's just hurting financially or it just bothers them because they don't want to own an empty house. Those are the folks you should make offers to and uh, you should make offers with owner financing. So, you know, read the book if you get a chance. There's, there's a lot to learn about this business. And, uh, you know, the more you learn, the, the better deals you're going to make. Yeah, absolutely. And from from that standpoint of, you know, trying to, you know, look at the benefit of owner financing, um, you know, that obviously is probably more of a, a benefit to, you know, maybe dealing with the investor because you're like, you're talking about, you know, people that, you know, want to get out of something quick and they're having trouble making payments. Typically they have encumbrance on the property. So selling the property, you know, isn't, like you said, not going to be so much of a, of a tax burden since our owner occupants. So in the looking at that, what are some of the things that people can in general use to kind of help to try to identify that? Because it's all, you know, it's, it's great to say, Hey, you know, if you find these people, these are the kind of the things and the benefit and, and how you can kind of frame that. But obviously most people are looking at, you know, how do you find those deals? What are some really high level things that people can do to try to help identify those things? Is it just going on and knocking on doors kind of like the bill cook method, or is there some other, um, you know, like intricacies into that, that might be, you know, again, very high level, like might be a benefit, um, you know, to, to people trying to actually just get out there and find these deals. Yeah. Well, Bill Cook's one of my students, as you know, we, we've been taking people out knocking on doors since the seventies. So this is not a new idea, but Bill's really good at it because he used to sell things door to door. And, and that's great training. You know, I used to deliver papers. Uh, kids don't deliver papers as much anymore, but when you did that, you were really a door to door salesman because you like knocked on somebody's door and you ask them if they want to subscribe to the newspaper. If they said yes, then you gave them the newspaper and you went back and you had to collect the money for the newspaper. That was excellent training for what I do today because I'm not afraid to talk to people. And folks who are afraid to talk to people or just don't have that experience are, are the people that I love to get in my class because once they get out and, and talk to people in a neighborhood and in a good neighborhood, and they, they see that people even in, in you know really nice neighborhoods have financial problems. And actually, if you think about it, rich people have bigger problems than poor people do. You know, poor people may have a one month payment problem. The, the rich guy may have, a, you know, the, the 20 percent of his value problem. So uh, one reason I buy better houses in better neighborhoods is I get bigger discounts when I buy. 
if you think about it for a second, you know, how, how far below the market can you buy a hundred thousand dollar house? And how far below the market can you buy a three hundred thousand dollar house? You know, obviously, you can buy the three hundred thousand dollar house further below the market dollar wise than you can a hundred thousand dollar house. So I find that uh, I, I look for houses in neighborhoods where I have less competition. Uh, I actually talk to people. I don't do a lot of mailings. I don't do a lot of internet work. I, I actually talk to people, get referrals from folks, many times from realtors. I buy about half my properties through realtors. You know, they know that if they call me up and say, John, we've got a house that somebody needs to sell in a hurry, that I will make them an offer that day and I will close it that week if they really need to sell in a hurry. So a lot of the properties I buy are from people who are in a hurry for some reason. Uh, and sometimes it's opportunity. I, I bought a house from a lawyer here in town who had an opportunity to take over a law firm in a different town. And he just needed to go right now. So he, he gave me his house. I gave him no money. I took over his existing loan and I gave him a note, which I paid him when I sold that. Well, I never have sold that house. I still own that house, but I paid that note off years ago. So there's a lot of reasons people will sell to you. Uh, and and uh, the best way to find these people is to develop a referral network through realtors, through bird dogs, through other people who are out doing things that maybe you won't do. You know, if, if you're not willing to walk through a neighborhood and talk to people who live there and look for empty houses and look for opportunities, find somebody that'll do that for you. My friend Jack Miller used to pay kids and he would pay them a dollar if they would bring him an empty house, you know. And these are people, the people who are out in the neighborhoods mowing grass, cleaning pools. People are out driving through neighborhoods all day long. And a dollar doesn't sound like much, but, you know, Jack didn't pay much. <laughs> he was kind of a thrifty guy. So, you know, I'd be willing to pay somebody uh, much more than a dollar for an empty house, but specifically uh, for a house that uh, has been empty for a while, you know. So, uh, you know, bird dogs, uh, folks who are out in the neighborhoods looking at property all day long, postmen, you know, you name it, you can use your imagination. But if you're not willing to go out there and meet with people and talk to them to find these opportunities, know that they are always out there. There are always opportunities out there. Uh, there's thousands of empty houses in every town. Not all of them are for sale, but a lot of them that people need to sell do not have a for sale sign in the front yard. So if you're just dealing with houses that have a sign in the front yard or that are listed with brokers, you're missing a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And I think people kind of really, uh, you know, underestimate the fact that there are, you know, absolutely empty houses. And, you know, one way that I've done, you know, try to find houses in my neighborhood for investment is, you uh, I just got there and walk. You know, I walk my dog, you know, three miles every night on a couple different loops through my neighborhood. And you'd be surprised when you go around and look if there's, you know, eight o'clock at night and there's zero lights on at a house, you know, not many people, you know, go to bed before, you know, that, but, you know, you can kind of, you know, go around and just walk and see if there's, you know, leaves that never get brushed off the front doorstep. If there's, you know, all sorts of different stuff that you can, you can, you know, after you walk by something enough, you can kind of tell if there's someone in it or not. And to that effect, you know, I think of people, a lot of people, especially on the investment side of uh, real estate, kind of, you know, maybe throw a little shade at the, uh, you know, residential realtor network, you know, of people, you know, whether, whether they deserve it or not is, is a dis different discussion. But, you know, the first people that, you know, most people call if they're in trouble to sell a property is a realtor. You know, a lot of people aren't plugged into the, you know, the pulse of the investor network. They don't have a John Schaub say, hey, you know, I need to get out of this. I'm going to call him. You know, the majority of people in the in the world, you know, say, hey, you know, if I want to sell a house, who do I call? I'm going to call a realtor. And if you have that network of realtors in your area, you know, of, you know, people that want to sell fast, you know, the realtor get a commission, you know, whether it's commission on the sale or something, you know, they love to get it sold quick and they know they don't have to go through a 30 day sale and they can, you know, get money and get in and out quick. I think that's a really good point to bring up is that, you know, having that network of people that can, you know, do the work for you is important and don't underestimate, you know, you know, again, from the investor side of things, people, you know, kind of, you know, shy away from the big commercial side of things, but that's where everyone goes to sell property initially, if they have a problem, you know, it's not the investors going to the realtors, it's the people that want to offload these properties quickly are going to, you know, realtors offices. So having that good network, I think it's a really good nugget of information to, uh, to put out to people, um, you know, something that I, I necessarily wouldn't have thought of before having this conversation. Um, and with that said, you know, you talk a lot about, you know, education and, you know, obviously people need to learn how to do this stuff. I understand you have a class coming up here uh, in a few weekends. Uh, it's a Zoom call that you're going to be kind of going over some of the stuff that we talked about today. Could you maybe go over a little bit of that? 
Yeah, you know, um, most of you probably know if you've lis listened to Alex before, my friend Peter Fortunato. Uh, Peter and I have been friends since the 70s. We've been friends for probably close to 50 years. All our kids grew up together. We've uh, been hanging around. We own property together. We make deals with each other. And we like teaching with each other. Uh, Peter and I take different approaches to a lot of things, but we agree on the type of properties to buy. We agree a lot on how to rent them and, and how to finance them. But you'll see if you can join us, it's Saturday, June 4th, it's when we're teaching this Zoom class, uh, that you know, you'll know you get two answers to a lot of questions. But we, we just come at it from different directions. So this, this class is really is based on a lot of the questions we get from our students on a regular basis. Peter and I both teach and, and like to teach. And, uh, and we're both very curious people. You know, I, I love students who come to my class and, and come up to me at the break and they've got a yellow pad with 10, di 10 different questions on it, you know, that, that aren't re directly related to what we've taught, but are, they're just, their mind's working now. They're thinking about things they can do and they want to know how they can do it. So this class is, is sort of a question and answer class. We'll be answering a lot of questions that we've already heard uh, that people have asked us already that are very important to people about the economy, about how to deal with the, the coming changes in the economy, about how to, uh, to take advantage of the opportunities that will certainly be there. And, and uh, so that'll kind of be the focus of, on what's what's going to happen now in the market and and how to take advantage of that. Uh, so it's a, it's a class that starts at 11 o'clock in the morning. So you get to sleep in if you're on the East Coast, but we have a lot of West Coast people who will be on the call. So that, that's eight o'clock in the morning for them. So it'll run from 11 and it'll run for six hours straight. So it'll run to five o'clock in the afternoon. And then we'll take questions and answers from the audience after that. So we, we'll, we'll be on the call probably as long as you want to be on the call. Uh, and we've done this before. And these are a lot of fun. Uh, if you get to a lot of new material uh, and uh, Peter and I uh, love to teach. So uh, we welcome you to, to join us. It's uh, the best way to sign up is on my website. It's uh, John uh, Schaub at it's www.johnschaub.com. So my name, J-O-H-N-S-C-H-A-U-B, johnschaub.com. And uh, that's the only way you can sign up actually. So we welcome you to come if you're able uh, we will not record it. You know, when Peter and I answer questions, uh, you know, we, we uh, often come up with some pretty creative solutions. And these are not solutions we want everybody in the world to hear. So they're just for you. So come if you can. Uh, it's $2.95 for the day. And, uh, you know, no travel expenses, no hotel expenses. It's a bargain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, speaking from experience, I've uh, been at attending to, uh, several of John and Pete's classes over the years. The, uh, the information is invaluable that you get from them, but not only that, the other people that come into these classes as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great to have, you know, the, the many, many, many years of experience between the two of them, but you also have hundreds of years of real estate experience uh, in the room with you uh, when you come to these and you'll definitely learn something. So again, I really appreciate your time this morning, John. Um, this has been another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Alex. Thank you for tuning in to the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of the Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.